Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Brain Scratch. I'm John Lorden, back with my still somewhat bloody eye. Um, thank you all for all of your well wishes in the comment section. I really appreciate it. And just know it does not hurt whatsoever. It just looks really weird. <laughs> but thank you for sticking with me. Um, and a big shout out to researcher Blue Meanie. This is Blue Meanie's third story that she's researched for me. Um, she does a really good job she actually did such a good job on this case that I don't think I can cover everything she sent me. So I'm going to start a new section on brainscratchers.com. If you go there today, you'll see a selection on the left called Deep Dive Files. And in that Deep Dive section, you will find essentially all of her raw information that she sent to me to make this episode, which includes a ton more links than we're going to be able to review um, a lot more theory and other things you can dive into. So hopefully you'll head over to brainscratchers.com and check that out. Um, today we are covering the murder of Adam Walsh. You are probably familiar with Adam's father. That is John Walsh of America's Most Wanted. Um, essentially what happened to his son uh, helped push him into a different career path. And he has done a bunch of amazing work uh, on that show and several other shows since. Uh, and also in terms of creating new laws, creating new systems for trying to uh, keep children safe. And quite honestly, um, I don't know if there would be a brain scratch or a searchlight without America's Most Wanted. Um, I, I used to watch it a lot um, back when it was on Fox and I just always appreciated that he was trying to help other people and that's definitely something that I think comes through uh, in Brain Scratch. So if John Walsh happens to see this someday, thank you so much for inspiring uh, the rest of us in ways that maybe you're not aware of. So that being said, let's jump into the murder of Adam Walsh. Adam John Walsh was an American boy who was abducted from a Sears department store at the Hollywood Mall in Hollywood, Florida on July 27, 1981, and later found murdered and decapitated near Abacoa, Florida. I don't know if that's Abacoa or Abacoa. Um, his death earned national publicity. His story was made into the 1983 television film Adam, seen by 38 million people in its original airing. That is insane. That is a huge, huge number. 38 million. I can't believe it. Uh, his father, John Walsh, became an advocate for victims of violent crimes and the host of the television program America's Most Wanted. One additional piece of information about the Adam movie uh, that I wanted to cover here. The three broadcasts of Adam were followed by pictures and descriptions of missing children as of each of the respective broadcasts. A hotline was also active to take calls regarding the children. This was ultimately credited with finding 13 of 55 children from the 1983 broadcast, including future rapper Busy Bone. Uh, Busy Bone later did a song basically uh, dedicated to Adam Walsh. Uh, and 19 of 51 children shown in the 1984 broadcast as of two days after the 1985 showing, 3,522 calls had been made to the hotline and five of 54 featured missing children had already been found. So as you can see, just the creation of this movie and the extremely wise decision to do something good with art by adding these missing people at the end of the film really affected the world in a pretty positive way. That's a lot of cases that got solved by that, which is very cool. So we're going to jump back to the timeline that Blue Meanie sent me. Uh, November 14th, 1974, John and Revae Walsh welcome their first boy, a boy they name Adam after his grandfather, John Walsh Sr.'s nickname. July 27th, 1981, Revae and her son Adam, now six, make a trip to Sears in Hollywood, Florida. Reve goes to look for a lamp that was on sale. Adam stayed behind at a display for the new Atari game system where older children are playing the games. When Reve returned minutes later, Adam was gone. Reve searched to no avail. They page for Adam, but he never comes. John Walsh is called to the scene along with police. Over the next few weeks, John and Reve made several televised and published appeals for Adam's safe return, offering $5,000. August 10th, 1981. 16 days after he went missing, a severed head is identified as Adam Walsh. It was 120 miles from where he was taken. His torso is never found. So for a bit more detail, we're going to jump back over to the article. 
Um, here we see basically the same information. Uh, it was an Atari 2600 system that was on display and um, a store manager informed her that a scuffle had broken out over whose turn it was at the kiosk and a security guard demanded that they leave the store. And I've seen some different accounts about what happened here, but um, I've seen a few different places where they talk about this. I've even seen one mention of a videotape of the boys leaving the store that was made available. And apparently the security guard was very young. He was uh, 17 years old. The security guard asked the older ones if their parents were there, and they said that they were not. It was later conjectured by Adam's parents that he was too shy to speak to the security guard who presumed that he was in the company of the other boys and put him out the same door. Based upon Reve's claim that he was in the store with her, it was assumed that he was then left alone near an exit that was unfamiliar to him. Adam's severed head was found by two fishermen on a Vero Beach canal. Uh, the rest of his body has never been recovered. The coroner ruled that the cause of death was asphyxiation and that the decapitation had occurred later, perhaps to render his remains unidentifiable or the cause of his death indeterminable. Uh, pretty interesting twist here. Adam's father, John Walsh, was considered by authorities as a prime suspect as the police investigation started to become exhausted. After about a week, he was absolved of any foul play following a highly emotional press statement that was televised nationally. I believe they also gave him a polygraph test, um, so that cleared up John. And, you know, I don't think it's necessarily a misstep on police's part to look in that direction. I think in a lot of these cases, um, it might be a family member, so uh, it kind of makes sense, but it's a part of the story you don't hear too often, so I wanted to, to share that with you. So the major culprit here is Otis Toole. Uh, he was an American drifter who was convicted of six counts of murder. Um, this is a pretty sad story, just even right from the start. Um, Otis Tool seems to have some uh, mental disorder. Uh, I believe his IQ is only 75. Um, he went through an extremely rough childhood, um, and it seems like that abuse is kind of just what built up into um, this adult that got together with another man who was a, uh, a murderer and they kind of went on a spree together. Uh, that being said, the other man was not involved in Adam's murder and in terms of Otis, um, that is the official conclusion by the police. It was made literally decades later. Just a little more into the background here, um, Otis Elwood Toole was born and raised in Jacksonville, Florida. Tool's mother was abusive. Tool claimed she would dress him in girls' clothing and call him Susan. His father was an alcoholic who abandoned him. Otis claimed that as a young child, he was a victim of sexual assault and incest at the hands of many close relatives and acquaintances, including his older sister and next door neighbor. He claimed that his maternal grandmother was a Satanist who exposed him to various satanic pra practices and rituals in his youth, ex including self-mutilation and grave robbing, and dubbed him Devil's Child. Toole claimed his abuse began when he came out as gay to his family. Another tidbit on Toole. In early 1975, Toole returned to Jacksonville after drifting and hitchhiking through the American South. On January 14, 1976, he married a woman 25 years his senior. She left him after three days after discovering his homosexuality. Toole said during an interview his marriage was a tactic meant to conceal his true sexuality. Um, and you just have to wonder if, uh, if he was raised in a different time, if this would have been as much of, a, of an issue, um, or if he would have been kind of as abused as a child. It just it seems very unfortunate to me um, that this guy has a backstory that there's no way it can justify murdering people but it comes as close to justifying it as I've ever seen. It really seems like this guy was kicked around in a pretty hard way as a child. Um, and that, to any child, is, is unfortunate. Almost seems like he was never given a chance. Here's a photo of Lucas and Tool. Um, Lucas is the other guy that was known to be conducting some murders uh, in this area, and they eventually got together. And we get two confessions. On October 21st, 1983, while imprisoned for two unrelated murders, Tool confessed to the 1981 murder of six-year-old Adam Walsh. And something very interesting to point out, check out that date, October 21st, 1983. 
If we go back to the article about the film, Adam, it was initially aired on October 10th, 1983. So I am not sure, um, I don't know about in the prison system at that time, were they allowed to watch television? Is it possible that he saw this film and then kind of tacked himself into the story? Is it possible that other detectives saw this film and maybe went and questioned him, kind of leading him down to uh, attach him to that story? And uh, we're going to review some evidence a little bit later that I think might put your mind in a split about that one because I'm really not sure. So there is a website called justiceforadam.com. This is a great place for you to do a deep dive yourself. Um, Willis Morgan, who claims that he is actually a witness um, at Sears that day, and we'll have a little video clip with him in a, in a moment. He's been working to get as many of the case files as he can and to post them here. Um, so there is just literally a wealth of information that you can find on this site. And we're going to review a few of these case files here. Um, this is an examination of Otis Tool's statements. Basically, one of the confessions that he's given, this is an investigator going over that information and comparing it to known facts in the case. Um, I'm going to have to turn the screen sideways here so we can read this together. But there's some interesting things that um, I notice about this. First of all, let's see. Talked a little boy out of a store in Hollywood, cut the boy up, and dismembered the head. And the fact that they're attributing that to is kidnapping occurred from Sears store at the Hollywood Mall, head found in canal, remainder of body not found. Well, the interesting about that statement is what we reviewed before about the little boy actually not being in the store. And this statement seems to allude to the fact that Otis was actually in the store and talked to the little boy, talked him into leaving the store. Um, according to what we heard from the management of the store, the little boy was led to the door and was literally outside of the store. So minor discrepancy there. Um, discussed city of Hollywood locations, naming Young Circle, a small airport near a mental institution and an Amtrak station. Locations mentioned exist in Hollywood. Um, I don't know how that is a real strong fact pertaining to the case. We know that this guy was living in Hollywood. He's probably familiar with the area. Um, if he did see the television show and heard that it was the Sears in Hollywood, Florida, uh, he might have been familiar with that location already and new landmarks around it. So I'm not really sold by that one cut the child's head off, cut the body up, and burned it, threw the head in something like a creek. Victim was decapitated, remainder of body never found, and head was found in waterway. Um, you know, pretty close match there. Of course, we don't know where he burned it. Um, talked of Opalaka and Overtown. Actual locations. Once again, I'm just not sure that that's worth noting on this type of investigation. Picked up child in a shopping center. Victim was abducted from Hollywood Mall. Had to hit the child. Dr. Wright found victim's nose fractured. And I didn't know that until I actually reviewed this. That's another one of those pieces of information that doesn't uh, come out too often. Um, there's another document we're going to review in a little bit, which is uh, a transcription of Otis's statement. And he does say that the boy began crying and that he struck him. So that actually might line up. And that is one of those pieces of info. If that was not publicly available, this could really make the police start looking at this confession and in some way validating it. Um, it could also be that it's a pretty common occurrence for a kidnapper to uh, maybe fantasize about those events happening. I mean, I don't, th I don't think it would take too much if you were writing a story about this instance and someone was being kidnapped, the kid's gonna start crying, the kidnapper is going to do something to try to stop the crying. Um, so, you know, being hit in the face, could it be coincidental? It's, it's possible. Through head in canal, head was found in canal. Um, burned the body in a pit at his mother's house. 1983 search was conducted and no evidence was found. So at least they noted a discrepancy here. Um, from everything I've seen, I have not seen any information about a possible... Um, possible remains found at any of these locations outside of the head being found. 
And it, as we know from shows like Making a Murderer, um, there should be some bone fragments left behind. I, th I believe that he said that he burned the body in an old refrigerator. Um, I think that would have kept some of the remaining dust at least in there, and they probably likely would have found some bone fragments in there. Um, we've also done research on the temperatures it takes to burn a body. We know that you have to get that fire up to uh, 1400, 1600 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, is it practical that someone does that in their backyard in a refrigerator? Um, I'm, I'm not sure, but just definitely something to consider. Using a Cadillac, known to operate a 71 black over white Cadillac recovered uh, and presence of blood discovered. What's interesting about that Cadillac is it has since disappeared along with a knife and a carpet sample that was removed from the car, all of them now missing. And that really uh, makes me scratch my head and wonder a bit about what's going on with the uh, people that are responsible for maintaining that evidence. Lured boy to vehicle to show him a video computer game. This is literally the only document where I see that being mentioned. In most retellings of the story, he is telling the boy that he has toys and candy in his car. I've even seen quotes directly from him where he says toys and candy. Um, so I'm not sure where this video game uh, idea came from. Although if, see this, this is where the story starts getting weird. If he found the boy outside, he wouldn't have known that the boy was there to watch the Atari game. So he wouldn't have had that in his mind to say, oh, well, I can obviously lure this kid away because he's interested in video games. Um, so this is another one of those places where the story is really starting to divert for me, um, and I'm not sure which way to believe. Committed crime alone, Henry Lee Lucas, basically his lover, uh, was in jail on 7-27-81, uh, through head in canal of off the interstate, head found in a canal at mile marker 174, at the turnpike. Once again, did they publicize that information when the head was actually found? Was it on the news? Is this something that he might have been exposed to in some way? Um, I don't know. I could go on with this document, but we've got a lot of other things to cover. And just know there are multiple inconsistencies. Um, he also has a pattern of admitting to this crime and then recanting his statements over and over and over. Um, but it is worth noting that there was supposedly also a deathbed confession. Here on his Wikipedia we have uh, on September 15th, 1996 at the age of 49, Otis Toole died at Florida State Prison of cirrhosis and his body went unclaimed. He was buried in the Florida State Prison Cemetery. But up here um, Tool's niece told John Walsh that her uncle confessed on his deathbed in prison that he had murdered and decapitated Adam Walsh. So as usual, I will have links in the description box below. We're going to jump into a part of the transcript now. Um, essentially, years later, uh, tapes of the one of the confessions came out, and this is a transcript of one of those tapes. Uh, he's being interviewed by Paul Ruiz, so that's the PR that you'll see in here. Um, so let's start here. I got all the parts of the body all effing jumbled up in my head and it ain't making me think clear. Uh, Paul says, very possible too. See, you are thinking. Let me ask you this. Why is it that you hesitate to try and find the rest of that body? You are hesitating. Otis responds, I wouldn't be hesitating if I couldn't exactly remember where I throwed it all out at. But you can. I wouldn't be hesitating if I could really remember. Well, don't you think that maybe you may not want to remember? Is that possible? You did it, didn't you? Yeah. What do you think? Like I say, they can run together in your mind. Not the child, Otis. Not the child. That child don't run together unless you killed several children. Do you think you've done that? Well, maybe since I killed some 14 and 15 year olds, maybe that's run together. You're getting caught up on them, aren't you? Otis, think about what I just said. You have to really, really dig down real hard for you to try and convince me that you don't know where the rest of that child is. Can't do it. And what you're doing now is a very, very basic way of forgetting. See, you will go so far and then you block the rest of it out. But there is no way that you will ever be able to be satisfied with yourself because that is the one area, I think, 
is why we all agree that one area where it bothers you the most and it shows some feelings. Uh, another investigator in the room says, we're going, to try, we're going to find him in the morning. You and I are going on a plane ride tomorrow. We're going to find him tomorrow. Otis resp responds, try to. Paul, he thinks where you might start is the same area where he threw the head. Otis responds, yeah, I did tell him that. Could be possible. I chopped his head off right there and throwed the rest of the parts right there. Um, I don't know about you, but in this dialogue, and I've read through the whole thing, um, he keeps talking about it as if it might be possible I did this. It could be possible I did that. And there are problems even with the facts that he's trying to say might be possible. For example, he goes back and forth between saying he chopped up the body. No, I didn't chop up the body. I cut off the head. I threw that in the water and I threw the body with it. Um, the body would have probably been found. Uh, there, admittedly, there is alligators. Uh, one of the reasons why they uh, couldn't do underwater searching is because they were worried of the alligators in the area. To me, his language is constantly theorizing. It really reminds me of uh, Brandon Dassey uh, being interviewed on How to Make a Murderer and just the way the investigator is leading these facts and then it almost sounds like Otis is kind of theorizing with him. Well, yeah, I might have done that. Um, his story switches several times just in this one interview and apparently he gave, I think, over 24 confessions um, and many different variations on the facts um, it just, it doesn't seem to me that this is a guy that is telling the truth and he might be seeking some type of glory for attaching himself to this crime and it seems like he might have, he might have gotten it, he might have achieved that goal. Let's bounce back to Blue Meanie's research real quick. And she has put a quick list of suspects together. Um, they really looked in all directions, like we mentioned, they looked at John, they looked at his wife, Reve. Um, she was also given a polygraph. James Campbell, a family friend who lived with the Walshes for four years, he was given polygraphs. Alejandro Marcos, also given polygraph. And then Jeffrey Dahmer. Well, yes, as a matter of fact, let's watch a little video clip. This is from CNN. Two years later, a miserable drifter named Otis Toole twice confessed to killing Adam and twice bragged he made it up. That Adam Wolf case isn't uh, any true. What is it? Tell me that. I didn't, I didn't do that case. Tool was never charged in Adam's murder, and for 26 years, the search has gone on for answers. I just spent a lot of time going through and seeing, looking for mistakes, looking for clues. Crime reporter Art Harris has spent several years digging into the Adam Walsh case, and now has come to a conclusion. Your conclusion, who killed Adam Walsh? I believe Adam Walsh's killer is Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer, one of the most infamous serial killers in American history. So that was Arthur J. Harris, who is an author and has done a bunch of research on this case. I've read a section of uh, one of his books. And let's roll to another video clip. This is from Fox News, and we can see uh, Arthur J. Harris here. Um, also, this is the guy that is responsible. This is uh, Willis Morgan, the guy that made justice for Adam. This is Willis down here. And both of these guys supposedly saw Jeffrey Dahmer at the Sears that day. Uh, let's hear what they had to say for themselves here. Let me bring in those gentlemen. We have Willis Morgan again joining us and Bill Bowen. Willis, I'll start with you. Were you contacted and what did you see that makes you believe that Adam was murdered by Jeffrey Dahmer? Okay, first was I contacted. Uh, what time are you talking about? After 92? When Detective Smith took over the case? Yes. No, he never called me. I called him one time, and I tried to tell him what happened at the mall, and he would dismiss me with, yeah, right, when I tried to tell him. And even the first time he said, yeah, right, I tried to continue telling him what happened, and I get to where Jeffrey Dahmer was standing over me with this demonic look in his eyes, and I'm starting to get nervous, and he goes, ah, yeah, right, you're scared of him. All right, well, let me, I only have 30 seconds left here, okay. unfortunately. Let me bring in Bill. Bill, what did you see? Well, I got out of my car at the Sears store, and I saw a man holding a little boy up in the air, screaming, I don't want to go, I'm not going. And this gentleman threw the little boy by one arm into the van, the blue van that I saw, and sped off. And you believe that little boy was Adam Walsh? It could have been. I only saw the backside of the little boy, but I did see a protruding chin and a forehead 
of a man with an army jacket on, I believe. All right. Well, it's a, it's a so unfortunately, that's all the time that Fox News would give them. <laughs> Seemed like they only had maybe not even a minute each. And I think you can see why people are skeptical. I mean, you have one guy that's trying to tell a story that Jeffrey Dahmer at one point is looking over at him, uh, looking down at him with some kind of demonic expression. Um, when I go researching these things and when I listen to people retell stories about true events, when I hear things that are obviously fictionalized um, or sound like they're fictionalized as if the person is writing a, a novel, I know that that's not how memories are typically recanted. And it really sets off alarms for me too. So um, unfortunately in his case, I think if, if he did see what he's seeing, he's overstating things and it's making people stop and not consider what he has to say. Um, the other gentleman admits he didn't even see this guy's face. He saw a chin and a, and a jacket. And is that enough to make a positive identification for Jeffrey Dahmer when Jeffrey Dahmer was not even known in the media for another decade? And then all of a sudden you see this guy on the news and you're like, oh, that's the chin that I saw? I really don't know. Also worth noting, two of these guys on this image right here are authors making money specifically off their stories. So um, that's another thing that you have to wonder when people are being motivated by financial gains. Um, you know, books, I read true crime books, and I see where authors sometimes will go to what I consider a bit of a self-delusional spot because they know if they get to a fantastic part of the story that the book is more likely to be popular. Or if they come to a conclusion that no one else has reached before, that that could put the book into a different area in terms of PR. And both um, of these gentlemen, I have to kind of, both of the authors here, I have to kind of question. Um, particularly, let's take a look here. This is from The Unsolved Murder of Adam Walsh, Jeffrey, Dahm Jeffrey Dahmer's Dirty Secret, written by Arthur J. Harris. And this chapter, um, you can come here, uh, I'll have a link down below. This chapter is called A Facebook Friend Request. My other interesting pursuit in 2009 began in November with a Facebook message. Someone wanted to friend me. His name, he said, was Adam Walsh. This was his message. I thought you might be interested to know that Jeffrey Dahmer did kidnap me. I survived, but another flock of boys died while I was captured. I cannot afford the special DNA test for transplant survivors, but this is a known fact for all of my childhood friends. My foster family is still in denial. Um, I'm going to jump down here. When some people thought that I was Adam in the 80s, they did a blood test with negative results. The truth is that I have had a jaw and scalp transplants, as well as tissue and nerves that skew the rudimentary DNA analysis. Man, that is a fantastic story being spun. And the author um, says that after three years of research, he can't discount that this guy is Adam Walsh, despite the fact that his ears don't match. Apparently he had surgery on his ears as well. Um, he tells a story about Otis Toole actually showing up at Jeffrey Dahmer's place. There is no known association between them. Um, it was pretty hard for me to read this account and to believe that this is really Adam Walsh. A full scalp transplant, I haven't even heard of. Um, and I don't know why someone would necessarily do that. Uh, also, DNA testing in the mid 80s, I don't think they were doing DNA testing. If they were doing a blood test, that would be a simple analysis of probably trying to check your blood type against the known blood type of Adam Walsh. So I don't, even that part of the story, uh, I don't really buy. Um, and you have to believe that the decapitated head was not Adam. And apparently they have done DNA analysis between Adam's mother and um, bone fragments taken from the skull, and there is a match. Outside of that, there is a huge piece of information here. Um, back at justiceforadam.com, I found this investigative report that is essentially analyzing why Adam Walsh was found in such good condition. Uh, here we go. In reviewing this case, the question arose as to why there seemed to be a lack of damage to the head and face from either insect, marine life, or bird life. So 
essentially they found this kid's face. Uh, admittedly, we know his nose was broken, but um, it wasn't all that damaged. And just in case you're curious, the analysis here leads to uh, Dr. Rodriguez states that there are many variables, but basically it comes down to what type of life is present in the environment. Are they in a foraging state? And is there a sufficient quantity of their normal diet for them to ignore what is basically a foreign food source? Dr. Rodriguez pointed out that criminal and medical investigators often erroneously conclude that because of an absence of animal or fish feeding on a cadaver that the remains must have only recently been deposited. So we know that his face was found in a state where he was likely still recognizable. Um, they do mention that there's skin slippage, but they don't mention any other trauma um, to his face. So, pretty interesting. And if that wasn't enough, here we have a link um, for a blog on the kidnapping and murder of Adam Walsh. In 2011, Reve Walsh sat down with Nightline ABC to discuss a new book, Bringing Adam Home, which tells the story of her son's case and the tragedy that they went through. Uh, we're gonna jump down here a little bit. And she's basically talking about how grief-stricken she is even decades later. And she says, we are going to get a cold case detective. We're going to start from the beginning and have this man work this case. I don't care if you go to work just to pay the bill of this private investigator. Uh, she was saying this to her husband and John said, I know the guy. That guy was Joe Matthews, a retired police detective who had been briefly involved in the Walsh case early on and was critical of how it was handled. After combing through the case file, Matthews made a major discovery. A roll of film from the crime scene of Otis Toole's car. It was film that the original detectives never bothered to have developed. Pictures show bloody footprints on the driver's side of Toole's car. On the rear floorboard of the car where Toole admitted to tossing Adam's severed head Pictures show the bloody outline of a face. I have a blood transfer from Adam's face onto the carpet. You can actually see his image. It's as clear as the Shroud of Turin, Veronica's Veil. It's clear. He showed the picture to the Walshes. To me, it was the one thing that a mother knows is that this is their child. That this picture is their child. This is the piece of evidence that ties everything together for me and I can go to my grave knowing that not only that I did everything that I could, but that I found my answers in that photo. So the family is very content with the findings. Um, they believe that is their son. Uh, the imprint being in Tool's car and being a, a photo that came from that series um, definitely leads them to believe that Otis is in fact guilty. All of that being said, this is not a technical, uh, scientific result. Um, it's really a shame that the blood samples could not be DNA tested uh, at this point, because that would certainly put it together. The problem I have is that we know Otis was involved with other murders. Um, and you have a grieving family and you're relying on the analysis of their grief or a filter of their grief on their analysis. and. Um, is it possible that she is seeing her boy's face? For sure, it's possible. Is there some possibility that she's seeing someone else's face and thinking it's her boy's face? That is still possible in my mind, which is unfortunate. And um, I think at least for them to move forward and have that belief um, is probably the healthiest thing that they, that they could do. Um, all of that being said, the detectives in this case um, the police that are involved with this case, I just can't believe that this evidence went missing and they can't do DNA analysis to firmly conclude what happened here. Um, that is the biggest crime outside of this actual murder that I see around this case. As a matter of fact, it makes me wonder a bit, how did all that evidence go missing or why did that evidence go missing? Is there some reason why that evidence was uh, removed purposefully? Uh, for example, if DNA testing all of a sudden was becoming popular and someone in charge knew that that case would not hold up to that scrutiny and ordered that information to be destroyed, um, something along those lines, I can't quite cut that out of my mind. Um, just to touch on it, I know I kind of streamed away from the guy that's claiming to be Adam Walsh on Facebook. Um, I continued reading that book from there and it went into an analysis about the dental imprints and while 
there's some controversy around it. Um, you know, the dental records show that Adam had a filling in one particular tooth. The author um, got information from the coroner's office, and there's some debate if that information lines up or, or not. Um, I did not find it very compelling. I find that the author is spending a lot of time trying to force the point that the, the tooth is not a match, and there are pretty reasonable assumptions that could be made about how that information was misconveyed or seen by different experts in a different way. Um, I personally did not find it very compelling at all. But just to say it's there, I just wanted to share that with you. And finally, I don't think that you could tell the story of Adam without reviewing the aftermath. Um, there were many amazing things that happened from this. Uh, following the crime, the Walsh family founded the Adam Walsh Child Resource Center. Um, the Walsh family organized a political campaign to help missing and exploited children. Uh, this led to the creation of the Missing Children Act of 1982 and the Missing Children's Assistance Act of 1984. Today, Walsh continues to testify before Congress and state legislatures on crime, missing children, and victims' rights issues. His latest efforts include lobbying for a constitutional amendment for victim, victims' rights. The Adam Walsh Child Protection and Safety Act was signed into law by George W. Bush on July 27, 2006. Um, by the late 80s, many malls, department stores, supermarkets, and other such retailers have adopted what is known as a Code Adam, a movement first made by Walmart stores. A Code Adam is announced when a child is missing in a store, or if a child is found by a store employee or customer. If the child is lost or missing, all doors will be locked and a store employee is posted at every exit, while a description of the child is generally broadcast over the intercom system. Code Adam is a term that has become synonymous with a missing child and is a predecessor to an Amber Alert, which serves as a system of broadcast-driven community notification. So you can see, um, if nothing else, when I look at this story, I'm amazed at how the energy of grief wasn't allowed to fester in a negative way, particularly for John Walsh. Um, he was able to funnel all of that frustration and energy into a, a bunch of positive things that helped make this world a bit of a better place. And that being said, you know, John Walsh is a bit controversial. He's, you know, um, he says things here or there that, that some people might not agree with. Even his presentation on America's Most Wanted, he was being very aggressive about the um, criminals he was going after. But you can't deny the results of all that focus and energy. Um, I believe they captured well over a thousand uh, I think it was about 1,600, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, criminals using America's Most Wanted. Many, many children were found that were missing um, using that show. It was just an amazing force, and um, I'm happy that there was some type of positive outcome from all this. All that being said, is this case truly solved? Jeffrey Dahmer, um, I, I believe he likely would have admitted to that crime, and it didn't, while it fit his M.O. in terms of the, decap the decapitation aspect, it didn't fit his M.O. in terms of the age. Um, he was, admittedly, he would go for young men, but they were pretty much men. I believe he, the earliest victim he had might have been 14 or 15. This is considerably different when you're talking about a six-year-old. Um, and Otis, I just can't get over his own testimony. It just, it really rings back, it sends me back to watching that footage of Brendan Dassey being interviewed and how the investigator is leading all this information and he's just kind of pontificating about, well, yeah, I could have done that, and, yeah, I can't really remember. I think it's here, I think it's there. Meanwhile, the body was never found. So I'm not totally convinced that Otis um, is the culprit. I'm mostly convinced but there's still a big gap for me before I cross that finish line and say, yep, they've definitely found the guy. That being said, the case is closed as of 2008, um, which I think was another good step for the family because they were finally able to properly bury the remains of Adam, um, which can you imagine? I mean, you're dealing with this. I know that they had a memorial for him back in the 80s, but knowing that his remains are sitting in some lab somewhere for decades, um, so even if it wasn't Otis, I think that Otis kind of taking the blame for it might have been a few good steps 
for the family. Um, and once again, huge thank you to Blue Meanie. She did such a good job on this. And if you're interested in seeing all of the raw information she sent to me, which I, I can tell you there's a ton more detail than we were able to cover today, head to brainscratchers.com and check it out for yourself. Thank you for joining me on this one. I hope you have a wonderful weekend, and I'll catch you next time on the Geek and Dorks channel. Take care.